Thank you for taking the, the time to attend my talk. As I unveiled to some of you yesterday, what I'm presenting today is a project inside uh, a project. Uh, this research, uh, the research I'm presenting today, will be subject of a chapter in a volume regarding hidden, uh, hidden practices in institutional translation and interpreting. Well, uh, as Umberto Eco said in 1994, the language of Europe is translation. Especially during the enactment of legislation, translation facilitates communication, eases inter-institutional negotiations, and contributes to reconciliation of different legal cultures. Because when we think about uh, EU, EU translation, we immediately think about legal translation. Um, drafting and translation are intertwined processes during whole stages of the legislative procedure and in order to achieve equally authentic language versions of an instrument. At European level, we are in the presence of a translator-mediated communication. Language contact through translation of EU legislation has resulted in the creation uh, and dissemination of a standard, standardized lexical variants, structural features, and textual patterns in many EU official and working languages. So this is the bridge to uh, explain my PhD project, which is about something called the Eurolex. So variants created at the European level um, through contact um, languages uh, and the communication, uh, translated mediated uh, communication. And therefore, I felt the need to investigate tr translators' behavior and translators' agency in the European Union. That's what I'm presenting today. So, um, final acts, which are permeable to different legal cultures through language and subject to several political concessions through the very parliamentary process, are not exempt from criticisms, although uh, quality of EU legislative um, drafting has been a concern since the 90s. What does this mean? This means that at national level, attorneys, solicitors, notaries, judges, and different legal actors um, do not receive uh, legislation or EU norms in a friendly way. So the reception is cold. Uh, and why? Because the language used at European level, which is filtered and mediated, um, doesn't sound natural, fluent, idiomatic to national ears. And uh, that's uh, um, a new um, field of studies uh, that we are um, recently approaching. So bearing in mind possible language contact, uh, this possible contact, language contact phenomena, such as new lexical items, caulkers, borings, semantic extensions, etc. Eurolect, a term coined by Goffin in 1994, seems a more accurate term to describe these linguistic varieties. Uh, and and that why I'm telling this, because um, at national level, this uh, EU variety is usually um, called Eurospeak, Eurofog, um, in a pejorative way. In fact, there is a Eurospeak, but what transforms a Eurospeak into Eurolect, that's uh, something else that needs to be investigated. Not all languages, uh, and I'm referring to the Eurolect Observatory project, led by Professor Laura Mori of Rome um, that encompasses several researchers and uh, several countries, but not Portugal. Um, what they find out so far 
is that um, there is in fact you 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 elect varieties uh, with different degrees across different languages. For instance, in Finnish, the the the, um, the distance between the language used at European level and the national level it's tiny, but uh, in other language the the, the degree is uh, is bigger. So. I will try to do is to give you some background about the EU and uh, then um, uh, I will um, provide you with some um, background about key concepts, the methodology, the method methodology I'm using and the challenges I'm facing and I will present you uh, preliminary, preliminary results which are, um, although are preliminary, we can draw a number of, of conclusions. So, European is uh, composed of 27 member states, 24 official languages, uh, 500, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. Yes? Yes. Yes. Um, 5,552 possible combinations. So, no news here. So, it's a supranational intergovernmental um, organization. Uh, so, the European previously community um, is supported by uh, uh, or operates through a hybrid system of supranational intergovernmental inter decision making. Uh, the EU is equipped with a range of sovereign powers conferred by the member states so that decisions on specific matters of joint interest can be democratically uh, at European level uh, made, particularly to ensure free movement of goods, services, capital, etc. With, within the internal market, enact leg legislation in justice and home affairs, and maintain common policies on trade, agriculture, fisheries, and regional development. The EU develops policies and enacts legislation that directly affects the member states and their nationals. Each national audience is entitled to receive a legal act written in its own languages, and in the same way, citizens or every national is entitled to uh, pose questions and receive answers in their own language. Therefore, the respect for linguistic diversity and giving e equal rights to all official languages are linked with the principle of democratic participation in the life of the Union. So, um, it's important for the European Union to communicate the European project to, to everyone. And therefore, um, European Union relies on translation to exist and to function. Of course, and the, the motto of United in Diversity, the EU speaks with a single voice in every legislative act across 27 member states and 24 official languages. And since its inception, which dates back to the 50s, Multilingualism has reflected in the EU's unique approach to foster a cultural and linguistic acceptance while pursuing common economic, political, and social objectives. The European Union is the sole international organization to have a number of official languages equal in number to all those formally declared as such by the member states at the time of stipulating their accession treaties. Some say that official languages are those used officially between the institutions and the citizen, while working languages are the ones used within the institutions during meetings. Uh, this is a thorny issue, the difference between uh, official languages and uh, working languages, because in theory, uh, all official languages are working languages, and practice, we see that English is the mainly used language, followed by French and 
uh, with a lesser degree uh, by German. Um, so, English, French, and to a lesser degree German, informally dubbed procedural languages. So, working language and procedural language are more or less used interchangeable. Uh, Lee. Um, so, these languages are used for drafting of internal documents and interpretation. So, according to the treaties, all official languages are working language, but we can't also can't ignore the fact that there is a pivotal language system due to uh, the in, in numerous languages of the European Union. Um, member states have to use uh, again English, um, French, and German as pivotal languages, special. Uh, in the European Parliament and uh, the Commission, of course. So, uh, translation facilitates communication. Well, I, I think I said that. And um, translators, revisers, lawyers, linguists, and interpreters work every day to mediate and reconcile the various positions expressed within the Union. And at the same time, however, the activity remains largely unknown or invisible, especially to those outside Brussels, Luxembourg, and Strasbourg institutions. In the EU institutions, uh, just to um, differentiate the role of translators uh, and lawyer, linguists, or revisers, the legal services constitute independent uh, organizational entities separate from translation and other services. And one of the principal tasks of EU law and linguists is to ensure that all EU legislation has the same legal meaning in every official language. Lawyer linguists or legal revisers uh, must therefore be able to discern precisely the intention of EU legislation and make sure that this intention is accurately conveyed in their native language. Whilst doing some translation revision, mostly of translations of the Commission's autonomous acts, they now concentrate mainly on the legislative quality of the original documents and much less on the quality of translations. As for the European Court of Justice, the translators who are lawyers are titled lawyer linguists. So, uh, previously, the in the Commission, uh, uh, lawyer linguists uh, were called lawyer linguists, and now they are called lawyer uh, reviewers. And uh, the role of lawyer linguists has been changed all over the years. But uh, I would like to focus that um, they work on quality, um, I mean, in meaning, not exactly um, monitoring translations or translators. So I won't bother you with much detail about this. Uh, what I would like to um, highlight is that the European institutions are seven. Uh, there are also seven EU bodies and over 30 decentralized agencies uh, that work together. Um, course to address the common interests of uh, the EU and European people. Before that, um, the, three, the Treaty of the European Union defines the European Parliament, the European Council, the Council, the European Commission and the Court of Justice of the European Union, the Central Bank and the Court of Auditors has European institutions to further consultative bodies or organizations, nor granted the full status of institution, are the European Economic and, Cons and Social Committee and the Committee of Regions. The Commission stands for the common interests of the Union, the Parliament represents the interests of the citizens, and the Council of the EU serves the interests of the Member States. Starting with a, co a key concept, 
which is institutional translation and uh, trying to find some common ground and go from there because this is a um, controversial um, concept. Uh, institutional translation may be seen from narrower or broader perspectives. It usually refers to national, supranational, and non-governmental organizations, but it may include companies or public services. The label institutional translation, translation broadly refers to a type of translation that occurs in institutional, institutional settings. It usually refers, as I said, to national, um, supranational and non-government agents. So, um, this is the, 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 um, the definition commonly accepted uh, even if the author has a narrower or uh, a broader perspective. Any translation carried out in the name on behalf of or for the benefit of the of institutions is considered institutional translation. It also uh, is a means of speaking to a particular audience by and having a, a, a a broader um, perspective by a government agency, multinational organization, private company, individual person acting in an official status. And uh, as Kaskinen points out, it's also auto translation or self translation. And why? Because um, institutions, not all, but uh, in, in this particular setting, um, the institutions need a voice and their voice is translation and they auto-translate or self-translate. Institutional translate, translation encompasses a wide variety of, uh, of content and um, what I mean with this is that, um, and particularly in the European Union, all legal translation is institutional translation, but not all institutional translation is a legal translation. For instance, white papers, wind papers, web content, that is not considered legal translation. Uh, how about time? Am I okay? <laughs> Okay, so agency, the ability to exert power in an intentional way, as uh, Ellen, Ellen Buzla puts it, and willingness and ability to act. So what is here in focus is the, to the extent to which translators can take their own decisions um, when they are constrained by institutional procedures and when they standardize the, the standardized voice of the institution is one is the one to be heard. Okay, uh, I'm not delving here into a debate between structure and agency. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I'm trying to find a balance between uh, these two. Of course, there are norms and relations prevailing within uh, an institution or a human group, um, but we also bear in mind uh, translation behavior because um, there are norms that regulate how translators understand and perform their, their tasks and um, how do translators find the balance between their prima, primary principle, um, the citizens, and, um, and uh, the commissioner, uh, in this case the institution, is, uh, is my focus. So I'm, I'm investigating how translators individually and collectively construct and interact with uh, EU social and cultural structures. So I launched a questionnaire. Um, right now, um, only freelance translators have answered. 
and uh, this is one of the, the challenges I've been facing. Uh, someone is afraid of translation studies in the European Union, uh, especially or particularly uh, in the Portuguese unit. I've been stonewalled <laughs> uh, and um, I wasn't able to have access to translators uh, working for the DGP, uh, uh, the, the Commission. Therefore, I'm uh, having some issues finding people to answer the, the questionnaire. So far, I have 20 respondents. They describe themselves as being female, uh, so mainly female, which is not a surprise. They are between uh, 41 and 60 years old, which is not also a surprise because in this setting, um, the setting requires um, highly specialized people, professionals, with that comply with stringent requirements. This is not a surprise to you. They work part time for the institutions. 60% uh, have a background in languages, and 20% a background in other area, and 20% a background in language and other area. What I found out is that uh, most translation problems arise from cultural bond, system bound terms, complex sentence structures, and uh, uh, collocations. What is surprising, what was surprising for me, is that despite many resources and tools provided uh, to help them um, and by, by the, the European Union, they use PROS and DIPU, or DIPEL, as, as tools. Um, and it was surprising, not only because the, the EU uh, in, has invested uh, a lot in, in resources and, uh, and, and, and had tools and memory translations, and etc. Um, and they still use PROS, which for me is not a reliable source and uh, a tool uh, automatic translation tool and uh, in, instead of using the, 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 the one provided by the European Union they use professional judgment to inform translation decisions um, especially when the, there are contradictions between resources um, this was not a surprise because there are so many resources provided by the EU that uh, in there must be contradictions between them. And uh, I was led that people use professional judgment to uh, um, solve the problems that I found. I'm open to suggestions, remarks, <laughs> and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Teresa, for your presentation. And we'll be, well, not me, Teresa, we'll be taking questions now. I just have one very quick question before I think everyone's going to run for lunch. Um, you mentioned a few times how it's not just legal translation in the EU. Do you think, or I don't know, did you get any response in the in the questionnaires that might suggest that some people might see themselves as more than just maybe technical translators? I know, like for example, in the Committee of the Regions, they have commissions that deal with um, culture and things like that. I mean, if we think of literary translation, in a more sort of uh, open-ended thing and not just books and poetry and stuff. I wonder, do those people think of themselves maybe as literary translators as well? Well, I used uh, the European um, terminology and uh, documents are divided into categories and uh, I use them. So, of course, 
from legis legis legal documents, administrative documents, and, and so on, and the, uh, the degree uh, of, of uh, more requirements to be met. And, uh, so I, I use I use the EU terminology and uh, classification of documents. What I what I, I can say is that because they work part time and they, the, some of them teach, some of them have uh, other professions. Uh, they, uh, they, some, of, some of them are, are professional translators, uh, but not all. And, um, and even the ones that are professional translators have other professions. So they, depending, on the particular case, they see themselves more than uh, translators. Thank you. I have just one yes or no question, in fact. Is pivot the word that the commission <laughs> uses? That's my Pivotal. very last of me. Pivotal language system. Okay. Thank you. I was wondering about that. Pivotal language system. That is unfortunately we don't have time for more questions, but it was an amazing presentation. Muito obrigada por estar aqui conosco. Everyone, thank you so much. I know you are you don't want to go to lunch, and everyone just wants to stay here, but unfortunately, we have to go to lunch. Uh, we'll be back, but wait, don't get up. We'll be back at 2.15. But Hannah, our lovely Hannah, is going to give us a few tips on where to go around campus.